Sex and Character. Otto Weininger. 1906. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Publisher's Note. On October 4, 1903, Otto Weininger died by his own hand, at the age of 23 and a half years. There is perhaps in all history no other instance of a man who had produced a work so mature in its scientific character, and so original in its philosophical aspect as sex and character when he was no more than 21 years old. We will not attempt to decide whether this was the case of a genius, who, instead of developing his intellectual powers gradually in the course of a lifetime, concentrated them in one mighty achievement, and then cast off the worn-out husk of the flesh, or of an unhappy youth, who could no longer bear the burden of his own ghastly knowledge. Sex and Character is undoubtedly one of those rare books that will be studied long after its own times, and whose influence will not pass away, but will penetrate deeper and deeper, compelling amazement and inviting reflection in steadily expanding circles. It may be noted with satisfaction that the book is by no means in harmony with contemporary thought. The discussions, so much in favor nowadays, concerning the emancipation of women, sexuality, the relation of women to culture, and so forth, are deprived of their data by this publication. For here, laid down with all the penetrating acumen of the trained logician, is a characterization of sexual types, M, the ideal man, and W, the ideal woman, which traces all the much-discussed psychological phenomena back to a final source, and actually gives a definitive solution to the feminine problem, a solution altogether alien to the field of inquiry wherein the answer has hitherto been sought. In the science of characterology, here formulated for the first time, we have a strenuous scientific achievement of the first importance. All former psychologies have been the psychology of the male, written by men, and more or less consciously applicable only to man as distinguished from humanity. Woman does not betray her secret, said Kant, and this has been true till now. But now she has revealed it, by the voice of a man. The things women say about themselves have been suggested by men, they repeat the discoveries, more or less real, which men have made about them. By a highly original method of analysis, a man has succeeded for the first time in giving scientific and abstract utterance to that which only some few great artists have suggested by concrete images hitherto. Weininger, working out an original system of characterology, psychological typology, rich in prospective possibilities, undertook the construction of a universal psychology of woman which penetrates to the nethermost depths, and is based not only on a vast systematic mastery of scientific knowledge, but on what can only be described as an appalling comprehension of the feminine soul in its most secret recesses. This newly created method embraces the whole domain of human consciousness. Research must be carried out on the lines laid down by nature, in three stages, and from three distinct points of view, the biologico-physiological, the psychologically descriptive, and the philosophically appreciative. I will not dwell here on the equipment essential for such a task, the necessary combination of a comprehensive knowledge of natural history with a minute and exhaustive mastery of psychological and philosophical science, a combination destined, perhaps, to prove unique. The general characterization of the ideal woman, W, is followed by the construction of individual types, which are finally resolved into two elemental figures, platonic conceptions to some extent, the courtesan and the mother. These are differentiated by their preoccupation with the sexual act, the main, and in the ultimate sense, sole interest of W, in the first case, as an end in itself, in the second as the process which results in the possession of a child. The abnormal type, the hysterical woman, leads up to a masterly psychological, not physiological, theory of hysteria, which is acutely and convincingly defined as the organic mendacity of woman. Weininger himself attached the highest importance to the ethico-philosophical chapters that conclude his work, in which he passes from the special problem of sexuality to the problems of individual talent, genius, aesthetics, memory, the ego, the Jewish race, and many others, rising finally to the ultimate logical and moral principles of judgment. From his most universal standpoint he succeeds in estimating woman as a part of humanity, and, above all, subjectively. Here he deliberately comes into sharp conflict with the fashionable tendencies towards an unscientific monism and its accompanying phenomena, pansexuality and the ethics of species, and characterizes very aptly the customary superficialities of the many non-philosophical modern apostles, of whom Wilhelm Bolsch and Ellen Key are perhaps the most representative types. Weininger, in defiance of all reigning fashions, represents a consolidated dualism, closely related to the eternal systems of Plato, of Christianity, and of Kant, which finds an original issue in a bitterly tragic conception of the universe. Richard Wagner, whom Weininger calls the greatest of human beings after Jesus, gives artistic expression in his Parsifal to the conception Weininger sets forth scientifically. It is, in fact, the old doctrine of the divine life and of redemption to which the whole book, with its array of detail, is consecrated. In Kundry, 
Weininger recognizes the most profound conception of woman in all literature. In her redemption by the spotless Parsifal, the young philosopher sees the way of mankind marked out, he contrasts with this the program of the modern feminist movement, with its superficialities and its lies, and so, in conclusion, the book returns to the problem, which, in spite of all its wealth of thought, remains its governing idea, the problem of the sexes and the possibility of a moral relation between them, a moral relation fundamentally different from what is commonly understood by the term, of course. In the two chapters, The Nature of Woman and Her Significance in the Universe, and Woman and Mankind, we drink from a fountain of the ripest wisdom. A tragic and most unhappy mind reveals itself here, and no thoughtful man will lay down this book without deep emotion and admiration. Many, indeed, will close it with almost religious reverence. Author's Preface This book is an attempt to place the relations of sex in a new and decisive light. It is an attempt not to collect the greatest possible number of distinguishing characters, or to arrange into a system all the results of scientific measuring and experiment, but to refer to a single principle the whole contrast between man and woman. In this respect the book differs from all other works on the same subject. It does not linger over this or that detail, but presses on to its ultimate goal, it does not heap investigation on investigation, but combines the psychical differences between the sexes into a system, it deals not with women, but with woman. It sets out, indeed, from the most common and obvious facts, but intends to reach a single, concrete principle. This is not inductive metaphysics, it is a gradual approach to the heart of psychology. The investigation is not of details, but of principles, it does not despise the laboratory, although the help of the laboratory, with regard to the deeper problems, is limited as compared with the results of introspective analysis. An artist who wishes to represent the female form can construct a type without actually giving formal proof by a series of measurements. The artist does not despise experimental results, on the contrary, he regards it as a duty to gain experience, but for him the collection of experimental knowledge is merely a starting point for self-exploration, and in art self-exploration is exploration of the world. The psychology used in this exposition is purely philosophical, although its characteristic method, justified by the subject, is to set out from the most trivial details of experience. The task of the philosopher differs from that of the artist in one important respect. The one deals in symbols, the other in ideas. Art and philosophy stand to one another as expression and meaning. The artist has breathed in the world to breathe it out again, the philosopher has the world outside him and he has to absorb it. There is always something pretentious in theory, and the real meaning, which in a work of art is nature herself and in a philosophical system is a much condensed generalization, a thesis going to the root of the matter and proving itself, appears to strike against us harshly, almost offensively. Where my exposition is anti-feminine, and that is nearly everywhere, men themselves will receive it with little heartiness or conviction, their sexual egoism makes them prefer to see woman as they would like to have her, as they would like her to be. I need not say that I am prepared for the answer women will have to the judgment I have passed on their sex. My investigation, indeed, turns against man in the end, and although in a deeper sense than the advocates of women's rights could anticipate, assigns to man the heaviest and most real blame. But this will help me little and is of such a nature that it cannot in the smallest way rehabilitate me in the minds of women. The analysis, however, goes further than the assignment of blame, it rises beyond simple and superficial phenomena to heights from which there opens not only a view into the nature of woman and its meaning in the universe, but also the relation to mankind and to the ultimate and most lofty problems. A definite relation to the problem of culture is attained, and we reach the part to be played by woman in the sphere of ideal aims. There, also, where the problems of culture and of mankind coincide, I try not merely to explain but to assign values, for, indeed, in that region explanation and valuation are identical. To such a wide outlook my investigation was as it were driven, not deliberately steered, from the outset. The inadequacy of all empirical psychological philosophy follows directly from empirical psychology itself. The respect for empirical knowledge will not be injured, but rather will the meaning of such knowledge be deepened, if man recognizes in phenomena, and it is from phenomena that he sets out, any elements assuring him that there is something behind phenomena, if he espies the signs that prove the existence of something higher than phenomena, something that supports phenomena. We may be assured of such a first principle, although no living man can reach it. Towards such a principle this book presses and will not flag. Within the narrow limits to which as yet the problem of woman and of woman's rights has been confined, there has been no place for the venture to reach so high a goal. Nonetheless the problem is bound intimately with the deepest riddles of existence. It can be solved, practically or theoretically, morally or metaphysically, only in relation to an interpretation of the cosmos. Comprehension of the universe, or what passes for such, 
stands in no opposition to knowledge of details, on the other hand all special knowledge acquires a deeper meaning because of it. Comprehension of the universe is self-creative, it cannot arise, although the empirical knowledge of every age expects it, as a synthesis of however great a sum of empirical knowledge. In this book there lie only the germs of a world scheme, and these are allied most closely with the conceptions of Plato, Kant, and Christianity. I have been compelled for the most part to fashion for myself the scientific, psychological, philosophical, logical, ethical groundwork. I think that at the least I have laid the foundations of many things into which I could not go fully. I call special attention to the defects of this part of my work because I attach more importance to appreciation of what I have tried to say about the deepest and most general problems than to the interest which will certainly be aroused by my special investigation of the problem of woman. The philosophical reader may take it amiss to find a treatment of the loftiest and ultimate problems coinciding with the investigation of a special problem of no great dignity, I share with him this distaste. I may say, however, that I have treated throughout the contrast between the sexes as the starting point rather than the goal of my research. The investigation has yielded a harvest rich in its bearing on the fundamental problems of logic and their relations to the axioms of thought, on the theory of aesthetics, of love, and of the beautiful and the good, and on problems such as individuality and morality and their relations, on the phenomena of genius, the craving for immortality and Hebraism. Naturally these comprehensive interrelations aid the special problem, for, as it is considered from so many points of view, its scope enlarges. And if in this wider sense it be proved that culture can give only the smallest hope for the nature of woman, if the final results are a depreciation, even a negation of womanhood, there will be no attempt in this to destroy what exists, to humble what has a value of its own. Horror of my own deed would overtake me were I here only destructive and had I left only a clean sheet. Perhaps the affirmations in my book are less articulate, but he that has ears to hear will hear them. The treatise falls into two parts, the first biological-psychological, the second logical-philosophical. It may be objected that I should have done better to make two books, the one treating of purely physical science, the other introspective. It was necessary to be done with biology before turning to psychology. The second part treats of certain psychical problems in a fashion totally different from the method of any contemporary naturalist, and for that reason I think that the removal of the first part of the book would have been at some risk to many readers. Moreover, the first part of the book challenges an attention and criticism from natural science possible in a few places only in the second part, which is chiefly introspective. Because the second part starts from a conception of the universe that is anti-positivistic, many will think it unscientific, although there is given a strong proof against positivism. For the present I must be content with the conviction that I have rendered its due to biology, and that I have established an enduring position for non-biological, non-physiological psychology. My investigation may be objected to as in certain points not being supported by enough proof, but I see little force in such an objection. For in these matters what can proof mean? I am not dealing with mathematics or with the theory of cognition, except with the latter in two cases, I am dealing with empirical knowledge, and in that one can do no more than point to what exists. In this region proof means no more than the agreement of new experience with old experience, and it is much the same whether the new phenomena have been produced experimentally by men, or have come straight from the creative hand of nature. Of such latter proofs my book contains many. Finally, I should like to say that my book, if I may be allowed to judge it, is for the most part not of a quality to be understood and absorbed at the first glance. I point out this myself, to guide and protect the reader. The less I found myself able in both parts of the book, and especially in the second, to confirm what now passes for knowledge, the more anxious I have been to point out coincidences where I found myself in agreement with what has already been known and said. I have to thank Professor Dr. Laurens Molnar for the great assistance he has given me, and Professor Dr. Friedrich Jodl for the kindly interest he has taken in my work from the beginning. I am specially indebted to the kind friends who have helped me with correction of the proofs.